sorry, section, session, is called Cross-Cultural Perspectives on Dementia. Our three, our three panelists. Hey, where are you going? Barabay? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and they will be speaking in the order that they're listed on the program. First, uh, we'll hear from Annette Liebing, who's Associate Professor of Medical Anthropology on the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Montreal. She's the editor of Thinking About Dementia, Culture, Loss, and the Anthropology of Senility, which came out with Rutgers in 2006. Robert Schrauf, PhD, is Associate Professor of Applied Linguistics and a faculty affiliate of the Penn State Gerontology Center. Before coming to Penn State, he was Assistant Professor at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University with appointments in the Bueller Center on Aging and Cognitive Neurology, the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. He has conducted research on bilingual autobiographical memory among cognitively healthy and cognitively impaired older adults, cross-generational processes of acculturation, bilingual aphasia associated with Alzheimer's disease, and the development of neurocognitive assessment instruments for limited English proficiency adults. He's the president of the Association for Anthropology and Gerontology and active in the Gerontology Society of America. Our third speaker is Andrea Schreiner, PhD, who teaches and conducts health service, sorry, health services research in the field of gerontology. Her research focuses on the care of older adults with dementia across a variety of health services settings, from nursing homes to home health agencies. The bulk of her research was conducted in Japan, where she lived and worked for 12 years. She's examined organizations such as nursing homes, as well as family caregivers, focusing on how to improve quality of care and quality of life for persons with dementia and those who take care of them. Dr. Schreiner is currently on the faculty in the Department of Health Policy and Administration here at Penn State. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> For me, it's early still. I'm sorry, I have this voice of a cabaret singer. I have a terrible flu. <laughs> I will do my best. Well, in 1997, exactly the 19th of December, always Alzheimer's Day of Death, as you all know, a psychogeriatric center opened its door at the Institute of Psychiatry in Rio de Janeiro. It was neither the first nor the only sign of a new landscape of aging in Brazil, but it was certainly an important event which over the time contributed to changing notions of aging and memory. And this psychogeriatric center was founded by me, and I'm very proud of this, within the context of a growing popularity of Alzheimer's disease in urban Brazil. The CDA, as the center was called, offered free mental health services for older adults as well as research and teaching. It became the subject of interest in newspaper articles and TV shows, and soon we were no longer able to receive all people who needed psychiatric treatment. And when the Brazilian Reader's Digest published an article about our center, the Reader's Digest seems to be re read in the remotest place of the country, we received a huge number of letters from people describing their older relative symptoms and asking if this was that doença, the Alzheimer, they had read about in Alzheimer's, quite a complicated word to say in Portuguese. So when I was asked to speak here about Alzheimer's disease in Brazil, such an invitation always carries a certain expectation regarding culture-specific data, something like a tropical Alzheimer's disease. But what I want to do here, <laughs> but what I want to do here is to think about how to frame certain aspects we have already discussed during this wonderful meeting, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. So. In other words, I try to situate here certain claims, for example, a recurrent preoccupation of this conference was that in order to allow personhood to exist, a certain context has to be accepted and provided. 
or Julian Einstein, for example, as a neuroscientist, defended the point that in the case of Alzheimer's, it should be accepted that there are multiple selves. As an anthropologist, I follow Nicholas Rose and speak about possible selves, something that Ian Hacking also elaborated. So in this sense, I want to use my data from Brazil to make my point, and in order to do so, I want, in the short time I have here, to describe shortly two moments in time, 10 years apart, so around 1995 and 2005. And each moment will be seen through what I consider at the moment the central technology when dealing with Alzheimer's disease, the treatment with medications. The use of these medications creates pharmaceutical ethics particular to each moment in time. And each moment constitutes in a certain way a new birth of Alzheimer's disease in the sense that symptoms are grouped together in a new way and values and practices related to Alzheimer's emerge or change. And in each moment I argue people are made up. They live and experience the disease differently than in the other moment. Nevertheless, each moment described shows that Alzheimer's medication, like many other health technologies, can be considered a, a technology of hope. Hope related to medications channels actions of all people involved. Hope often diminishes the notion of risk and even, it seems, influences the efficacy of certain molecules, and I think Peter Whitehouse mentioned that in a certain way. Much of the discussion about Alzheimer's medications can be seen so in the light of faith in the potential progress in medical technologies. So in 1994, when I started to observe psychogeriatric consultations in Rio de Janeiro, public awareness about Alzheimer's disease was only starting in Brazil. Like here in the USA, where it started two years before, or two years earlier, this new awareness was a period of astonishment about this newly emerging medical category. Professionals, however, were already aware of the new importance given to the dementias and were discovering a field of expertise of which Alzheimer's was the icon of the wider psychogeriatric field. In fact, at that very time, every patient who arrived at the psychogeriatric clinic I observed was tested for dementia, just in case. Don't think that psychogeriatric knowledge has been imposed on Brazilian health professionals. Brazilian psychiatrists, neurologists, and geriatricians are actively involved in international knowledge making, and in fact, as some of you might have observed already, there's often a considerable Brazilian delegation present in international congresses on geron gerontology, geriatrics, psychogeriatrics, etc. The participation of Brazilian doctors in these events is very often sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry, and that's not surprising since Brazil is one of the leading markets for international pharmaceutical enterprises, especially at this moment when growth is not to be expected in richer nations due to the end of a number of patterns. But already at the beginning of the last century, there was an interest in dementia among Brazilian psychiatrists. Juliano Moreira, one of Brazil's most important early psychiatrists, was in constant contact with Emil Kreppelin in Germany. And um, Moreira's wife, actually, by the way, she was a German. She was described as a very rude person. <laughs> Kreppelin and Alois Halsheimer even planned to visit Brazil. Although the visit never took place, we knew that from letters that were thrown in the garbage by Juliana Moreira's wife after her death, and that was rescued by a Brazilian psychiatrist. <coughs> and when working in Rio de Janeiro, I was able to locate a number of historical texts on dementia in the library of the Institute of Psychiatry. But more recently, when Jorge Alberto Costa e Silva became the director of the WHO Division of Mental Health and Substance Abuse, he had the mandate before the actual uh, Benedetto Saraceno, he put a certain emphasis on the psychiatry of aging. Actually, it was him who told me at a certain time, uh, you should study psychiatry of aging, that there's the future. And even after Costa Silva left the WHO, his Brazilian colleagues Alex Kalash and Manuel Bertolocci are still at the WHO taking care of the uh, sections of aging and aging and mental health. 
Brazilians are present at consensus conferences. They are at the board of directory of the IPA, the International Secretariat Association. These are just some examples I wanted to give you that show that Brazil cannot be seen as merely a consumer of a ready-made category called Alzheimer's, but that Brazilians have been involved in its international shaping. So within this background of internationally circulating knowledge, it was clear from the beginning that Alzheimer's disease in Brazil and elsewhere, of course, belonged to the medical domain, and it was a disease that could potentially be healed. It just needed the right medications. And this general message did not go along with popular conceptions of senility in Brazil. Sclerosi, from the term arteriosclerosis, was popularly used to refer to two types of senility manifest in old people's behavior. One, a gentle sliding away from the living to the dead, um, kind of in-between state where the older person was mostly treated like a child, and two, especially when unpleasant behavior was involved, it was considered highly stigmatized craziness. Very often sclerosis was seen as the result of a person's life stress and strain or an especially heavy shock, something that is not specifically Brazilian as it might seem. This kind of conceptualization goes back to psychiatric theories of the last mid-century and which can be found in different groups worldwide. I even found it among health professionals in Montreal and Jesse Ballinger wrote about this, this time, um, Rothschild and his co colleagues. So sclerosis was generally treated within the family except when it was seen as a serious mental disease. So I don't want to claim that this was necessarily better or worse for the person, but depending on the case, it had a different constellation than today. However, although doctors at the beginning of the 1990s claimed to treat patients with dementias and in the media articles distributed a general optimism, doctors were only able to treat some of the peripheral symptoms of dementia. Psychiatric medications were prescribed for sleeping pro problems, psychotic symptoms, dysphoric patients. Concomitant diseases, especially hypertension and heart diseases, were evaluated and medicated, and vitamins such as B and E were sometimes added <laughs> because they were thought of as neuroprotective. But since the real cause and central symptom memory loss could not be treated, a general pessimism reigned among doctors concerning the patients. And as one doctor told me in an interview, I quote, we can only make it smoother for them. The last period of time diminish suffering, it's the family who should make them feel good. And another psychiatrist who just started to work in the psychogeriatric center, I observed, commented that she had to rethink everything she had learned until now and became a general practitioner again. I'm treating more the body than the brain, she said, referring to the many concomitant diseases present in the elderly and the little that could be done to slow neurodegeneration. At the time of my observation, Tacrine, the first nootropic Alzheimer medication, had already entered the international market and was available for richer Brazilians to import. People had to be closely monitored when taking Tacrine. I think you all know about this, and today it's not even longer in use. It had serious side effects. But these side effects did not stop this medication from nourishing hope. Now other better working medications could be at least imagined and emphasized the cognitive paradigm of dementia. Most patients of the CTA could not afford, of course, to import the new drug and continue to be treated with often heavy load psychiatric medications. And even when pressure groups forced the government to finally import Tacrin and it became more accessible, it was still terribly expensive for people with lower incomes who nevertheless wanted to do everything possible for their older relatives with dementia, so sometimes their whole salary went with Tacrin. Ten years later, around 2005, the picture had changed a lot. All four common neurotropics are now available in Brazil, although the iniquities of access continue. There's only one neurotropic Exelon which is which can be obtained for free from the state um, secretary of health, but this involves a very complicated process that can take months, and it's an only one place to get in this huge city of Rio de Janeiro, so it's extremely complicated. Doctors, however, became much more confident in their ability to cure Alzheimer's, and that was, I think, was Arthur Kleinman mentioned today, 
um, this was manifest in our new participant observation in the CDE, CDA, the unit I had observed and um, over 10 years earlier, as well in, as in the interviews we conducted. For instance, one neurologist interviewed made the following observation. With the technological advances, magnetic resonance, for example, one can make a more truthful diagnostic. One can now give names to different pathologies and patients before were stigmatized as being suffering from sclerosis. Now these patients have a real disease and even potentially, depending on the moment, have a treatment. With the appearance of the medications, Alzheimer's became a treatable disease and up to a certain point administrable. But recently, from the mid-1990s until today, people became more and more aware that not only medications are at stake, treatment is multidisciplinary. One needs family orientation, occupational therapy, speech therapy, one needs a whole team. This neurologist who works at a public hospital and also has a private practice like almost everybody in Brazil considers Alzheimer treatable although she confirms later in the interview that the current medications only slow down the decline. And this perspective is quite different from that found in the first period of observation in the mid-1990s when the diagnostic of Alzheimer's disease automatically entailed <coughs> impending de death. Now there seems to be something treatable, a phase of being alive before final decline. And for this period, the neurologist enlisted the multidisciplinary team because the people in this phase of aliveness and need occupational therapy and their families need to know how to maximize the person's capacities to enhance quality of life and general well-being. Not coincidentally, the latter two concepts, quality of life and general well-being as well as activities of daily living are very much promoted by the pharmaceutical industry. At this point, the interconnectedness of changing notions of Alzheimer's disease and the pharmaceutical industry can also be found in the interviews. A psychiatrist well known in the area of dementia research tells me that the way of understanding Alzheimer's has changed in the last years. This is because before, the principal issue for the diagnosis was cognitive decline and people only looked at cognitive decline quantitatively. But now, pharmacology studies started to pay attention more and more to criteria which before were secondary, which have now become more important in discussing Alzheimer's, as such as activities of daily living, behavioral symptoms, costs of diseases, caregivers' health, all these are now considered criteria of the disease and of its severity. And of course, medications with approved efficacy emerged in the last 10 years. In fact, this quote reiterates actual descriptions of Alzheimer medications produced by industry spin. The new generation of Alzheimer medications still target memory decline, which was what Dictacrine was conceived to, uh, to treat. However, these new medications are also designed to address notions like quality of life and activities of daily living. One explanation is that through the, through the growing public and medical awareness of Alzheimer's, people are now diagnosed much earlier and are therefore much fitter than people were 10 years ago. Another reason is that the efficacy of these drugs in treating cognitive decline could not be proven. And more and more studies show that the raison d'etre of Alzheimer medications stood on shaky foundations. The efficacy of Alzheimer medications had to be redefined to regain credibility. And compared to cognitive decline, quality of life is a fuzzy subject despite being well suited to measurement and analysis. So now medications can be shown to work, even if we often do not know what exactly quality of life stands for. Finally, along with the move away from cognition came a move towards using behavior and psychological symptoms defining and treating dementia. I wrote a bit about this in the book that Jesse and Peter are editing. And I should note here that although I'm articulating the interest of pharmaceutical companies in this new area of focus, this is not to say that pharmaceutical companies alone created the shift towards behavioral, psychological, and quality of life issues. On the contrary, 
Many health professionals have long argued, and I think this conference showed this very well, that attention to these areas is what is actually needed in dementia care. So what happened in the last 10 years, not only in Brazil, is that changes in defining Alzheimer's disease resulted in a double economy of hope. First, doctors see Alzheimer's as treatable because there's a general notion that medications are becoming more efficient and that there are potentially efficacious medications coming down the pipeline. Even though these doctors acknowledge that current medications do not hear in some talk now about stem cell research as one as a more realistic source of hope. So the first economy of hope is a general optimism. Second, new hope emerged, emerged through the creation of a new space of life, a period of time before final decline. This reminds me a bit of third age that was in a kind of created before fourth age of a very old age. So this new space of life is created dependent on a number of factors that I have mentioned before. And with the help of medications and, as one of these doctors said, with a multidisciplinary team, Alzheimer patients can now lead a life with certain restrictions. Death has been postponed at least for a while and people with Alzheimer's can regain a personhood unavailable 10 years ago, as long as they are able to maintain certain activities and a certain functionality. So concluding, what I wanted to show in these very short sketches of two historical moments is that the way people are made up depends of, on a number of factors, such as the historical moment, psychiatric notions of that time, notions of the body, political and economical factors, and general concepts of the person in a certain group. A point I could not further elaborate here, and I certainly do not want to defend that there is a Brazilian self or a Brazilian personhood. By paying attention to these possible selves, as well as Jillian's multiple selves, I believe we can enrich the understanding of Alzheimer's disease and the persons who suffer from it. Thank you. Morning. I too would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to the conference. <clears throat> I'd like to talk to you this morning for a few moments about uh, reversion to the first language in, in Alzheimer's disease. Reversion to the first language is, the, is a fairly simple phenomenon. It's the notion that a bilingual, <clears throat> particularly a consecutive bilingual, that is an individual who has learned a second language later in life as opposed to a simultaneous bilingual who learns um, one or more languages from birth. So for a consecutive bilingual, there's a tendency in the course of the disease to shift from, from uh, speaking appropriately the second language to an inappropriate, um, inappropriate speech in the, in the first language, meaning that you can't maintain the language switch with an interlocutor who doesn't speak, um, say, your, for instance, your first language. Um, so is there much of a problem here? Well, it actually is not very much evidence. There's a great deal of anecdata about this. Many people know um, many people know individuals who are in nursing homes and who now sort of slip into their native German or their native Spanish, etc. What little evidence there is for the phenomenon is um, comes from surveys of, of from surveys actually. So Schmidt looks at 61 long-term care facilities and actually interviews social uh, the, the, so, the the staff, social workers, etc., who report on on the residents, and they find that 53% half show reversion to the first language. Mendez and Perryman um, interviewed 51 caregivers at UCLA, caregivers are bilingual patients, and they too um, reported uh, patient preference for uh, the first language and decreased conversation in the second language. So what I want to do today is tell you uh, a sto uh, three stories, a sort of confluence of three stories. One has to do with this phenomenon of reversion to the first language. The second has to do with bilingual autobiographical memory. And the third has to do with a temporal gradient in autobiographical recall in uh, Alzheimer's disease. And to cut to the chase, this is the story. Over the course of the disease, consecutive bilinguals increasingly revert to the first language. That's reversion of the first language. The second story is autobiographical memories are preferentially retrieved in the language in which they were laid down. 
work that I've been doing in my laboratory for the last 10 years. And finally, over the course of the disease, autobiographical retrieval shows a temporal gradient favoring earlier memories. And so I'm going to walk us through these three um, bodies of evidence. First of all, the patterns of language loss in Alzheimer's disease are roughly these. Um, generally, generally um, there, there are uh, relatively few changes in phonology, people's uh, ability to comprehend and produce phonological forms of words. Generally, grammar is preserved until late in the disease. So if you, if you um, heard Eleanor Fuchs' wonderful presentation, portrayal yesterday, of her conversations with her mother, um, you'll notice that, that, uh, that in, over the progression of the disease, a person's ability to, to pr produce syntactically correct sentences despite the use of nonsense words is preserved. It's really a rather interesting phenomenon. Um, thirdly, the lexicon is affected from very early on in the disease. That's a marker of the disease. Word finding becomes very difficult. Um, the semantic organization of vocabulary is affected so that people can remember um, cover terms but not their exemplars. The supermarket test, for instance, is used um, to, 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 to look at this. So tell me about things in a supermarket. People typically start with the, uh, talk about the meat department and then kinds of meat and the produce department and kinds of vegetables. In Alzheimer's disease, frequently people can produce those cover terms, the departments, but not the exemplars. And then finally, discourse is affected so that there's a reduced information that's coming across. Again, interestingly, a pragmatic ability in, in, in uh, linguistics that's preserved in Alzheimer's disease is turn-taking. People, people continue, despite the fact that they produce syntactically correct sentences which don't mean anything, nevertheless, un, uh, t appropriately take turns. And so it's a rather interesting preservation. So what happens in, in dementia? Well, as a matter of fact, there are very few studies, and these few studies are done with few subjects, few, per, few participants. Here's a study done by uh, DeSanti and Lorraine Obler in, in New York. Um, what we have is uh, these, the, along the, along, right here we have the uh, behavior. So naming problems, obviously, um, inability to, to do confrontation naming. Paraphasic errors are errors. So say, for instance, a phonemic error would be saying tree instead of free or a semantic paraphasia would be saying fork and when you mean spoon, that sort of thing. Neologisms, the creation of new words. Uh, circumlocutions, my bugaboo. Uh, you can't think of a word, so you sort of talk around it and talk around it. Um, perseveration, oh, we all know what that is, the logical responses and topic loss. And the study compares um, four bilinguals who spoke Yiddish as their first language and English as their second language. And the pluses indicate a problem and the minuses indicate the absence of a problem. And you'll notice that the pluses tend to uh, favor the second language, so that there's a, this is reversion of the second language. The kinds of errors that are, f are found are found more in the second language than the first. Um, uh, uh, but again, this is a small sample, and it's, it's difficult to draw a whole lot of conclusions about that. Um, at any rate, I'm, I'm sort of interested in what might account for greater losses in this first language versus the second language. And so a kind of theoretical approach to this is, is based, um, as I'm working on it now, is based on the distinction between automatic processing and controlled processing in cognitive performance. So that a number of things that we do, oops, now what? So uh, taking linguistic examples, for instance, on the left side here, word pronunciation syntactic usage are actually uh, more subject to automatic processing than controlled processing in that they require very little attention or mental energy and they tend to be the execution of preformed chunks of behavior. You can't think about your pronouncing a word. You can't, we just can't do that. That's highly, uh, uh, subject to high automatic processing. On the other hand, controlled processing, for instance, would, would, would refer to things that require more attention and seem to be, uh, seem to be, uh, seem have less to do with preformed chunks. So for instance, turn taking in a conversation. So, um, given, so trying to map linguistics on here would suggest that certain kinds of linguistic components are subject to automatic processing, others to more controlled processing. Applied to languages, uh, uh, Michelle Parody, a neurolinguist in Canada, has, has, has advanced the theory that first languages are, as a matter of fact, almost always subject to more automatic processing versus second languages. And that, that should make some intuitive sense. If you learn a second language later in life, um, it requires more controlled processing. And m my uh, guess here is that we can draw the f following sort of picture here. So that along the bottom, along, uh, along the sort of the x-axis here, we have automatic processing on the left side, control processing on the right. Phonology obviously requires uh, a high degree of automatic processing. 
discourse uh, practices require more controlled processing. In a first language, you get this kind of array. A second language would be shifted slightly to the right so that all, all um, uh, 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 language behaviors require slightly more uh, controlled processing. So uh, given that, I, uh, let me go back one moment. One way of testing that would be to look at response latencies so that you would expect that things that require automatic processing would be executed very quickly. Those required controlled processing would require more time. So I used a, a bilingual aphasia test developed um, to test. Uh, we go, I could talk for a long time about this test. But at any rate, the, the point is simply that, that it allows for an equivalent test in both languages along the same linguistic dimension. So phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, discourse, etc. And it was uh, developed to determine whether performance in the first differs from the uh, performance in the second language in the phasic population. So the point here is I give this to um, three individuals with formal diagnoses of Alzheimer's disease who are Spanish-English bilinguals, generally older, so uh, 80, 76, and 72, one man, two women, uh, uh, from Cuba, two from Puerto Rico, not a highly educated group, um, 12th grade, 6th grade, 7th grade, aged immigration, so these are definitely consecutive bilinguals, learned English later in life, self-rated Spanish, very high, it's the first language, self-rated English, ranges around, um, percent of use of English daily is rather high, they're English dominant at this point, although their first language is, is Spanish, and their scores in the MMSC sort of locate them uh, at, at the stage of early Alzheimer's. So this is the reaction time data, the picture matches nicely that little theory that I had, uh, that I had proposed, and that is Reaction time, uh, oops, dog. So you see phonology generally, the response latencies are very, very fast. Semantics, they're rather slow. And given Spanish in blue and English in red, Spanish is generally processed much more quickly than, than uh, the second language English. And so it sort of maps this kind of, this kind of uh, theoretical picture. And th the story here would be that an individual with Alzheimer's disease um, is suffering, uh, suffering uh, more detriment to processes requiring control processing than automatic processing, and so you would expect um, these kinds of deficits in the se in a f uh, second language and not, uh, more than in the first. Second story I want to tell you is about bilingual autobiographical memory. And the story here is that memories are preferentially encoded and retrieved in the language in which they were laid down. <clears throat> done a great deal of work in this area over the years, and um, the the, this, uh, this would be a typical picture here. So along the, this, these are Spanish-English bilinguals. They're older now. They're all um, uh, 65 or older. They participated in an experiment in which they were given keywords in Spanish, keywords in English, and asked to think of autobiographical memories, 50 of these memories, 100 of these memories, and go back and date them. And subsequently, take, we take each of the memories and we try to figure out whether or not it's an English memory where people speaking English in the, in the in the, in the memory, did it take place in an English setting, or was it a Spanish memory? And so we plot Spanish versus English memories here, and what you get is a rather nice, clean picture whereby, um, uh, so these, all of these individuals in, immigrated to the United States at age, around age 28. So the vast majority of Spanish memories, obviously, uh, uh, tend to collect prior to immigration when these people were actually monolingual in Spanish and the vast majority of English memories tend to c collect later on in life. So their memories are encoded and preferentially retrieved in the language in which they were laid down. Is, does that mean you have amnesia in the other language? N not at all, but it's just, so it's a, a question of, of, of tendency and, and um, uh, uh, recall. So um, uh, finally then, there's the temporal gradient and autobiographical recall in AD, and what that means is this. That, so this is um, Copelman's work in England. Uh, the, the, there's a tendency, so uh, let's, uh, along the uh, x-axis here, we have childhood memories, young adulthood memories, and late adulthood memories. Along the y-axis, we have numbers of memories. Blue is controls, red is Alzheimer's patients, uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and you'll notice that, in general, Alzheimer's patients have a tendency to recall uh, memories from earlier on in life better, or at least more of them, than uh, memories from later on in life, which is consistent with what we know about the disease. So, pulling these three, th these three research strands together suggests that over the course of the disease, consecutive bilinguals increasingly revert to the first language. Secondly, autobiographical memories are preferentially retrieved in the language in which they're laid down. And thirdly, memory, personal recollections, tend to become limited 
more to, to, to events which occurred in the, in the remote past. So what's happening is an individual is, is reverting to the first language and, and, and has more and more difficulty recalling memories that, that were laid down in the second language and finds himself or herself with a, a progressive disease in which um, the language matches, language and, and, and memory matches may not be appropriate, may not be ideal for his or her setting. Take, for instance, an individual who is a first language speaker of German and is now in a nursing home, surrounded by individuals who speak only English. So I am who I am in part by being able to talk about my experiences. Um, reversion to the first language has, has implications for Alzheimer's disease in that if an individual um, um, can't maintain the language switch, then that affects their ability to carry on social conversation and maintain relationships. And that has obviously consequences for quality of life. Secondly, I am who I am in part because of my memories. It's not totally so, but without memory, we have a tendency to, to take a, a, a sort of serious hit to our identities. And so autobiographical memory is an extremely significant uh, 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 ability um, to, for maintaining one's memories. And then finally, helping me talk in that first language lets me be me. So again, if you think about an individual who is in a long-term care facility and cannot or doesn't have access to individuals who speak his or her second language, then cognitive decline may be accelerated. The individual's quality of life may be reduced um, disproportionately than, uh, in comparison to other residents in that long-term care facility. And perhaps we need to think about language interventions as justifiable and perhaps advisable. Thank you very much. Had a chance to meet anybody. Um, are you Michael? Okay, nice to meet you. I feel like the lurker at this conference. I had other things going on, and this is the first time I've been able to attend. But um, I wanted to thank everybody for putting this together, and I've had a great time listening to the ones that I was able to hear this morning. Um, okay, my name is Andrea Schreiner, and I actually received my PhD from Penn State, from the Department of Health Policy and Administration in the College of Health and Human Development and I had a gerontology fellowship and at that time Dr. Zarrett was in charge of the gerontology program so I think my research reflects a lot of his um, influences. Um, when I completed my PhD we moved to Japan which was to be just for a one year period during which we'd have another child and relax before we went back to the US tenure track nightmare. Um, we ended up staying for 12 years and so we raised our children there, and I did my research in Alzheimer's there. So I'd like to just share a little bit of, of it. And you said there's no sense of um, Brazilian, a unique Brazilian sense of self or selfhood. Or yeah, there definitely is a Japanese <laughs> unique sense of self. At least that's when you're there, you feel very much you're a foreigner. You're constantly being reminded that Japan is different. And so that was one of the things that drove my research. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about caring for family members. And I put up some kanji there. I had to learn how to teach in Japanese, um, which was um, if I was ever in a Japanese nursing home, I would really be in trouble because I quickly have forgotten most of it. But that's Kazoku Kaigosha, which is family caregiver in Japanese. Okay. <laughs> You've been speaking about family caregivers, and I don't know how much that's been defined. I think probably a lot of you have personal experience as family caregivers, but there is a lot of really nice information from organizations in the U.S. defining what family caregivers do and the types of people in those roles. And we do have a lot of research in this country, and it's unique in that way. But um, I think Anne mentioned that um, a lot of it's not disseminated to the public or they're just not aware of it. 
but at any rate, um, the definitions of caregivers, you know, caregivers are providing a wide range of all different kinds of help family to, to family members. And um, I'm going to focus on family caregivers, but there's informal caregivers as well, because people have mentioned, well, what happens when somebody doesn't have any family? Well, informal caregivers step in, neighbors or church members or, or whatever, or they don't step in and, you know, then you have very sad situations. But at any rate, family caregivers are providing the majority of care to Alzheimer's patients, and that's something I think the government kind of tacitly depends on because that's uncompensated care. They don't have to pay for it through Medicare or other, you know, Medicaid. So family caregivers do, if you figured out in dollars, you know, the amount of of care provided, if you could cost that out, it's millions and millions of dollars a year that we're expecting family caregivers to provide. So just some of the tasks, and you may be familiar with these terms ADLs and IADLs, and when we think of some of the things family caregivers do, assisting with activities of daily living, bathing, dressing, feeding, and more late stage dementia. and. Um, IADLs, which is doing all the shopping and phoning and managing bills and, and things like that. And these tasks get a lot more demanding and a lot more complex and challenging as a person progresses through stages of Alzheimer's disease where they, they need a lot more help with basic tasks of daily living. But in general, you know, the bottom line is that family caregivers are providing just a vast array of services. and on an emotional level. That's, I think, one of the main things that needs to be emphasized is that it's, a, it's an emotionally demanding job. It's a full-time, 24-7 job, more than 24 hours a day. But they're providing a vast array of emotional, financial, nursing, social, homemaking, and other services. Okay, so it's a, it's a really consuming life. I think when you step into the role of a family caregiver, it's taken over your life, for better or worse. Going back to, and, and I present that just to say that, you know, that's what family caregivers are doing in Japan as well. So there's not any differences when we're talking about um, Japan and the U.S. in terms of basic caregiving tasks and the role of the family caregiver, it's going to be the same. We're talking about developed countries that are, have pretty much the same infrastructures and those tasks are the same. But there are some questions that I just thought of um, in terms of guiding how I would talk about the millions and millions of things that I, I wanted to say about um, family caregivers in Japan, I, I just wanted to start with the question of, you know, is there a difference in how Alzheimer's disease manifests itself in the person's behavior? So do caregivers have to cope with a different set of challenges when they're helping with daily living tasks, or are they, are they confronted with basically the same things, or trying to work out the same things? And um, I would never have thought of that question, but it actually came up came out from doing the research. So, um, so that's that was one of the issues. You know, is it different to, to Japanese people with Alzheimer's? You know, do they express themselves differently as the disease progresses? And the other concern is, um, how is the culture different in terms of the family roles and expectations, gender norms, social values, and things like that? How does that influence the caregivers' daily lives? So um, this question of the, the symptomatology, you know, what, a, what kinds of behaviors do people manifest in different stages of Alzheimer's? Um, we conducted an observational study, and I was teaching at a um, university, and I was in a department of nursing. And we had a gerontological nursing division, which actually I was in charge of, and we were in a lot of different facilities. So we um, worked with these facilities in a collaborative relationship. They participated in um, our research studies and in turn we gave them a lot of teaching and education and a lot of recreational therapy programs. And it was a nice exchange. But um, we conducted observational studies but we also conducted just um, interviews with staff using a, a um, very common instrument that was used in the U.S. for decades. It's still being used and it's called the Cohen-Mansfield Agitation Index. Has anybody heard of that? She went and um, she was one of the first to just spend a lot of time in nursing homes and looking at the kind of behaviors that occur. And as Dr. Zarek mentioned, when you go to um, facilities in Sweden, you don't see those same behaviors because it's a, it's a different environment. So these behaviors come from the environment. 
and so I should emphasize that um, Japanese nursing homes are structurally and functionally the same as U.S. skilled nursing facilities. They're organized around that same time clock. They have the same level of providers and staffing ratios, and so it's, it's the same environment. So what we did was take this agitation index scale, which looks at 29 types of behaviors that people with dementia will do, um, and they're, they're agitated behaviors, so they're doing it because they're not happy in this environment. And we looked at the rates of frequency with which those occurred. But the interesting thing was that um, when I went about translating this scale, because they didn't have a Japanese version of it, and it's very easy because it's just behaviors like um, repeating questions, asking the same question again and again, um, also things maybe hitting or striking out, things like that. When I went to um, ask colleagues to help me into translating this, their first response was, oh, yeah. Schweiner Sensei, this is Japan. People don't do those things. And that, I heard that repeatedly. It was really interesting. They, they, you know, and these were people in a nursing faculty. They say, oh, you know, no, no, no. You know, these Japanese older people, they're not going to hit somebody who's trying to give them a bath. You don't understand. Bathing is part of Japanese culture. You know, and, and, and I was really amazed. I was like, you're, you're, you think those, you know, socially imposed norms are going to maintain in a state of late Alzheimer's, but they did. And they're, so I was told, you know, you don't need to study that. There's no agitated behavior. You're just not going to find that because we're different. We're not like, you know, U.S. aggressive, agitated, demented people, which is, I, I know we're not supposed to say that, but. Okay, that's um, some of the residents at one of the facilities that we looked at. And, um, Actually, they were a very happy and very cheerful group. But that's just showing the, the behaviors that we looked at. And all that table shows is that, much to my surprise, because I actually did think there would be some differences in the manifestation of agitated behaviors, they were virtually identical to what nursing home residents with Alzheimer's disease sh show in the U.S. because the environments are the same. So most of the acting out did occur around bathing. <laughs> Because that's a very demanding. It's a. It's a very. You know. There's. There's a. People are in a hurry. They're. You know. Ripping your clothes off. It's glary or it's. You know. Hazy in the room and it just isn't conducive. To, conducive to being relaxed and trusting. So a lot of agitated behavior demonstrates itself in bathing time. So that was. You know. It was interesting to see that despite the expectation that Japanese Alzheimer's patients would be different they were in fact the same because the environment was the same and the staff didn't have any real training on how to deal with these people and make the experience better for them which is what we were there to give them um, and we did things like look at the factor structure and everything fell out the same way and I should say which I think um, Steve alluded to for staff the most upsetting behavior and the one they had the most trouble with was not aggressive behaviors like punching which will occur when you try to take somebody who has pain in their joints and you're trying to rip their clothes off to get them in the bath as quickly as possible they will definitely you know reach out and hit somebody but the staff the, that wasn't what stressed the staff the most the things the staff had the most trouble emotionally dealing with was constant requests to talk to their mother or to go home those were emotionally really draining and they didn't know how to deal with that. And as Steve mentioned, um, we did talk, we used Naomi File. Do people know Naomi File? Validation therapy techniques? Okay, we, we taught them a, like a, just a simplistic version of that, which is just respond to the emotion, which is what Steve said. If they want their mother, they're lonely. So you sit down and talk with them. Um, okay, so we did, as I said, we had the same, you know, same, same presentation of symptoms. There wasn't any difference. So the next question is, so in what way is a caregiver, especially in a family setting, going to be challenged by, by cultural differences? How is family caregiving going to be different in Japan? And I think it is very different for two main reasons, which is a difference in the formal medical education system. They don't have a degree of geriatric psychiatry that we have, and they don't have as advanced clinical psychology as we have. And the Japanese university system is really just now approaching good doctoral programs in the larger universities. But, you know, they, they don't have the developed research established that we do. So that's one of the barriers, which I'll get back to. And the other is a difference in roles and responsibilities of women, particularly daughters-in-law. Okay? So there's a whole set of social expectations about how daughters-in-laws should behave to um, their in-laws, and that has a big impact on family caregiving. Um, so in terms of one of the big stressors is people have talked about the need for early diagnosis. 
what happens is family members will be presenting with memory loss and agitation, signs of Alzheimer's. They'll go to their primary care physicians who are the gatekeepers as they are in this country and the physicians don't have background in geriatric psychiatry or geriatric medicine and they'll basically um, just say this is normal. They're getting older now and this is a normal condition. So they basically, there's a, a term chihobio, which is what that is, and that just is kind of like an umbrella term for um, dementia seen as a normal part of aging. So except in the established research centers where they're looking more at gerontology, this is what you'll find in the majority of primary care centers that, you know, somebody that comes in and they can't understand the behavior of their, you know, parent um, will just be told, well, this is normal, or maybe they have chihopio, which just means, oh, they're just getting old. Ooh. <laughs> okay. So the sum of those two things, the difference in the knowledge base, the, the, the lack of um, using clear-cut diagnostic criteria to really measure and assess when somebody is entering early-stage Alzheimer's, and the difference in family roles and relationships creates a different um, cultural differences in early stage dementia. And I can tell you a lot of stories about that in terms of, um, you know, um, a lot, it, there's a, assumptions that older people are always respected and treated well in Japan, which is, again, a, a misperception. It depends on families, it depends on rural, urban, and socioeconomic differences. But there are a lot of families that are still multi-generational or families that have small businesses. And um, we worked with a daughter-in-law who was um, responsible for taking care of the family business. And her mother-in-law worked in the shop with her. And her mother-in-law could no longer run the register, count change back. And um, so the daughter-in-law spent the most time with her and was realizing that there was something going on with her. And every time she would discuss it with other family members, she was told that, um, you're just um, making her anxious, you're making her nervous, you're impatient. So it's always putting it back on the other person. You know, there's nothing wrong with mom, it's you just don't know how to handle her. So the bottom line is I think that the family caregiver stressors are different because of cultural norms and expectations. And um, this whole group of invisible caregivers who are the daughters or the daughters-in-law. I think it's harder for daughters-in-law, but um, you know they're the ones that are doing all the caregiving, and other family members are kind of denying the fact that this is a person that you know has a serious problem, cognitive loss. I'm not going to go into that. But that's just as Steve mentioned. Um, that was a model that he's done a lot of work on stress and coping, which just. Um, emphasizes the fact that caregiver burden is serious. It has serious psychological and physical consequences. He mentioned the rates of mortality are higher in family caregivers and rates of depression are much higher. Okay. So those are just some of the things. There's, um, you know, it really affects your entire life and certainly mood and physical health decrease for family caregivers. <laughs> So um, basically in the U.S. all the literature on family caregivers says that for a long time they've been the hidden victims of Alzheimer's disease in the sense that, um, you know, you used to take your family member with dementia to the physician and, you know, most family members never get asked in reality, how are you doing? Even though we heard this morning that's ideally what physicians want to be doing is taking care of the family caregiver as well as the the person with Alzheimer's, but that in reality I think rarely happens. So in Japan it's kind of exacerbated by the fact that you're a family caregiver and in this culture, you know, the role of women is to just kind of shut up and put up, especially if you're a daughter-in-law. And that's just emphasizing the research that in the U.S. shows that the burden tends to be greater for women, tends to be um, burden tends to be higher for older women, women with other chronic health conditions, you know, people that have poor financial resources, and so on. So those are just some of the other things you have to look at when you're looking at caregiver burden. 
Now, one of the things that we also studied was um, in trying to improve coping among family caregivers, what are the important personal psychological resources that people bring to this new role? And there's a lot of literature on the concept of mastery is what we used in the, um, ter in the scale that we looked at. And it was just a way to measure the degree to which an individual feels they can control the things that are happening to them. And the most important result from the research on these psychological resources is that people with higher self-mastery, people that believe they can take charge of their environment, have much less depression, report lower caregiver burden, have much better outcomes. So we tried to design intervention studies that would improve that, that sense of control over your own circumstances. But we did find that um, the Japanese caregivers that we looked at in our study, they did score a little bit lower on their mean levels of mastery, so of mastery than the U.S. caregivers had, which I think is also culturally related. Okay, so for developed, you know, Alzheimer's disease is a problem of developed countries. You know, you're not seeing it in countries where they have low life expectancy. And when you talk about the prevalence, I think everybody knows it increases exponentially after age 65. So in countries where you've got a large population over 85, like the U.S. now and Japan, you know, it's something that you're going to see increasingly high rates of prevalence. And um, the issue is, one of the huge issues is how are you going to get family caregivers to stay in this role and maintain it? Because um, it's optimal for the patients up to a certain point. I think that at some point it, it, it may be better at the late end stages to go into a facility, but it depends. But um, it's definitely most people, you know, overwhelmingly want to stay at home. And most family members, not all, there's huge variation, but a lot of family members want to keep them at home as long as they can. And as I said, you know, the U.S. government and the Japanese government, they stand, stand to make a, a huge, uh, save quite a bit of money by encouraging family caregivers to, to do this, to accept this role. But there's five things that are going to influence the supply of caregivers in Japan as well as the U.S., and those are just general demographic trends of, you know, the, the, our, our family structures are more complex now. So defining like whose responsibility it's actually going to be when you're divorced and have multiple sets and remarried and you know that's it's going to be hard to figure out who's responsible for taking care of whom. And again um, geographic mobility is a huge concern in the U.S. because family members are not living together as much as they are in a country like Japan. But that's even a problem in Japan. And um, decreasing family size. Right, We're getting a lot of older people and not as many, the birth rate has gone down in certain populations. Um, and delayed childbearing, just having more women in the workforce. Those are going to decrease the supply of family caregivers. And that actually gives an estimate. There was a study published in Health Affairs, um, and this was several years ago actually, this was 1999, and it was estimating, trying to do an economic costing out of what you'd have to pay to get the services that family caregivers provide. And it was huge, 196 billion compared to 32 billion for paid home care and 83 billion on nursing home care. But I think one of the points of the papers that you've been listening to is that you know there are a lot of programs to really try to help family caregivers who want to assume that role, stay in the role, and have a high quality of life. The problem is getting people to be aware of them and getting people to participate in them. And and there, you know, the main barriers to these getting getting people to be aware of programs and getting them to participate. That kind of assumes that there's people to run these programs and people to work in these programs. And I know that. Um, for home care, it's increasingly difficult to get people that want to go into the home and be a direct care worker, you know, provide the custodial care that's needed. So there's a lot of, and that's a problem in Japan or all developed countries. But it is, as Steve mentioned, um, really important for caregivers to have social support, to have a respite caregiver, hopefully they have one, and, or to be able to use services like adult daycare. Those are great. And again, um, I think it was Ann that mentioned this as well. Um, family caregivers often just, they don't self-identify. And this is a spousal thing, especially 
you know, if you've been in a relationship for 60 plus years and you're taking care of each other, oftentimes, you know, you'll see a spouse who's basically trapped in the home, hasn't gotten out, hasn't done anything, you know, up several times a night, but they don't think of themselves as a family caregiver and they don't seek out resources. So it's really important for healthcare providers to help them identify. Okay. And that's it. I'm going to finish up because I was just told. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. I want to thank all of you. Yes, I want to thank you all for a really interesting panel. Um, and I guess I, I want to go back to Annette Liebling's talk and, and your discussion of the double economy of hope. Um, and what I want to ask you is, you you say you're using Nicholas Rose's work, and I've been sort of re reading and struggling with my reading of his most recent Politics of Life itself book, and. Um, what concerns me in that book is a representation of the laying out of options without an assessment of what he says he's doing, which is the politics of those options. And when you're talking about the double economy of hope, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about whether those two economies work seamlessly together or whether actually one is pushing out another. Okay, you talk about the economy of treatable Alzheimer's disease, pharmacology, etc. And then you talk about the new space of life that's being opened up because of these other modalities. Well, are they both just equally open, or is one closing out the other, which would tend to be my view? Well, first of all, um, my name is not Liebling. That means darling in German. <laughs> it's Liebling. It doesn't matter. Everybody says it. Um, <laughs> Now, what I wanted to show is actually that this space of created by hope, is, uh, there are so many factors that grab into each other that is so, because it can be looked at as positive, creating new space, but if you look at it from the pharmaceutical industry, you can say, well, that's all bad, and then you look, well, but there's a real need. So there's so many people, uh, so many factors coming together. I wanted to, to um, throw light on um, the heterogeneity of the space, of, of so many factors that are involved and that one concept cannot explain this. And, and certainly political um, factors, especially economical, are very important to construct this kind of hope. No? If I could, yeah. is this still working? If I could just follow up. I guess what I'm, I'm wondering is if there isn't a way in which as we focus more on technologies mm -hmm. of treatment, does what it takes institutionally um, and in other, every other way to do that focus, does that, does that actually tend, us, tend to canalize, tend to narrow, tend to channel our work into there, implicitly kind of closing out the possibilities that those technologies may be opening up, maybe, or other things may open up. That's, that's all. So like the space that might open for environmental treatment or for new ways of living, maybe being closed down, at least in the USA, because we're putting our focus into technologies, the techno space. Um, I think that we go a bit to what Peter said about um, also looking at um, the environment. And, and, and I think we always focus on something. Every explanatory model or ex ex every focus closes down in open spaces. And I think we have to look very carefully in there, try to do it historically a bit. And the more we look at it and put it in context from different perspectives, the more we can discover what exactly is it what's closing down. So uh, I can give you a straightforward answer. This exactly is being closed out. But I, th but I think there's a lot of critique against technology. But this critique also sometimes says, well, it's also life enhancing. And so, so I think we have to be very careful. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this linguistically marvelous uh, panel. They're very interesting and exciting. This uh, question came to me while I was listening to Robert, but I'll address it to all of you and perhaps also Jillian if she's still here. Um, one of the things that has interested me 
uh, historically is that uh, physiology writ large, not just neurophysiology, began by getting an animal and doing something to it, uh, creating a lesion and then observing what happened to teach us about what that part of the body would have done if it had survived. And uh, I've been intrigued in our work on mu music and dementia into how uh, dementia is an accident of nature and that it, it's created the lesion for us, whatever that might be. And yesterday we heard a lot about how the lesion isn't necessarily in the brain, but it could also be in the brain. And it has the potential to teach us a whole lot about normal function, linguistically, for example, or as music, but also socially and anthropologically and culturally. And uh, I'm just wondering what you think about that as an idea, and does it apply to you too? <clears throat> right. Um, it's often struck me, for instance, that a great deal of, uh, I shouldn't say a great deal, um, a portion of psychological research focuses on Alzheimer's disease more for what it can tell us about psychological theory because of the breakdown than, uh, than, um, than uh, a highly focused concern about the disease or the amelioration of its effects. That would certainly be, the, that would certainly be true. Nevertheless, I mean, it's um, the history of neuropsychology, the early history of neuropsychology is largely the history of make a lesion and see what happens and double dissociation, etc. Right. It's an interesting... Uh, it, I think somehow they have been neglected, just as you say, that uh, people with dementia, it's seen as the end of the line, so therefore not interesting. Uh, and the treatments aren't all that successful. And yet, in fact, we are surrounded by tremendous things to learn from these people that have been undervalued and under recognized and under incorporated into studies of all sorts of different things. I guess that's where I am. Absolutely true, absolutely true. This, this question is for Robert too. Um, I was thinking about that moment in Eleanor's presentation where uh, Lil, having had her uh, hip replaced, refers to her physical therapist as a bad priest. And I'm imagining that, that from a, a linguistic point of view, that would be described as a word-finding error, the inability to produce physical therapists, and as a circum circumlocution, um, because it can't seem to get directly to what it wants to get to. And as somebody who's had his hip replaced um, and found the annoying piety of the physical therapist um, uh, to be beautifully captured in that phrase, and as a literature professor, who has been taught to value metaphor, I think of Emily Dickinson's injunction to poets, tell all the truth but tell it slant, success and circuit lies. I'm wondering whether um, some of what I've heard from Anne and others about art, whether there's a way to depathologize this different language use and to see, without romanticizing Alzheimer's or autism or any of these other, other uh, disabilities, whether there's a way in which this diff very different kind of language use has actually been enabled, paradoxically, um, uh, uh, by this disease. And I, I'm just wondering whether in your field, whether there's any kind of movement to, to push back against the automatic pathologization of alternative language use. Among individuals with, with Alzheimer's disease? The short, I suspect, I, you know, it's always dangerous to do these things, but I suspect the short answer is no. <laughs> so, but, you know, that, that assumes that I know all of the researchers in the world who are doing all this. But, but I mean, at least my 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 um, uh, my sampling of the literature suggests that we are not actively pursuing what might be the creative release of of language. Um, however, one of the things you were um, pointing out the the, conte the, co the context there though, though does um, raise this other interesting point, and that is. Word finding, word finding difficulties, particularly when they result in those kinds of paraphrases, you get priest instead of whatever it would be. Um, um, uh, word finding is not just sort of, it is, is largely a result of, of uh, for instance, um, the constraints laid down by the sentence you're producing <coughs> suggest that there are only so many words that are going to fit in this spot, that sort of thing. Um, but there are also all sorts of other non-linguistic constraints that have to do with word finding. So the situation you're in, the whole context, your history, etc. Um, and in that sense, your suggestion would be um, a fairly interesting research avenue to, to pursue. And that is, well, maybe we should take much like Freud, take these, take these, these um, seemingly pathological productions and find out if there isn't something that's more logical going on, or, or 
richer, perhaps. I I have more of a comment than I do a question, and that this whole conference has been about quality of life and quality of self, which is absolutely terrific. And Robert, you've done a study which is dear to my heart because I've experienced it. And my mother did revert to her first language after she was in a nursing home in Providence. And it woke up the administration of that particular facility that, wait a minute, why don't we recruit some individuals who speak Portuguese because there was a large influence of Portuguese from the Azores. And I compliment you on that study. But yet you've limited it to, from my understanding, to facilities, to assisted living buildings, to nursing homes, maybe because it's easier to find people within those facilities. I implore each of you to think about working with home care agencies to study these individuals in their homes who have the wherewithal to stay in their homes, whether through Medicaid, whether through family, or because they have long-term care insurance or can privately pay it. And I think you'll find a difference in many areas because of the quality of life that they are experiencing at home. Just a minute ago, Ralph depathologized the language of the person with dementia, which, by the way, they sometimes use the expression quids, if you wish to use that. It's become common use of the person with dementia. I'm going to pathologize the language of experts now. In Japan, the Ministry of Health, Welfare, and Labor has a national campaign, public relations campaign, to change the word for what we might call in English dementia, chiho, as you mentioned, to nishisho. Chiho means the disease of cognition associated with idiocy, whereas uh, nishisho, the alternative term, means something like cognitive um, syndrome or cognitive condition. So the, the first is a statement that here's the Japanese government perhaps improving the quality of lives of thousands of citizens by having them uh, re remove the connotation of idiocy from the label that are being applied by professionals. In Canada, there is a group of, um, uh, led by Natalie Ross of the Alzheimer's Society that wants to get rid of the word demence from, uh, they've written to the international psychiatric uh, associations, and they think that in French, demence is more pejorative than dementia in English. So uh, to me, th these are all questions related to, um, if you're bilingual, should you pick which language to be demented in because <laughs> it may be a better experience. Well, if I just want to add, um, Lawrence Cohn suggested that we anthropologists should use senility instead of dementia to step away from the biomedical category. I mean, senility also has a very negative connotation. So I don't think, I don't, I'm not sure if this is really the problem, but maybe we should look at in which context senility gained this connotation. Because we, I mean, we could call it blah, 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 anything, and so we get completely off any connotation. And, um, maybe we should look at the world, how it came into, be, into being, etc., etc. And I don't think if we shift it, I don't know if, if in Japan it will change a lot. Well, <laughs> probably address that a little bit. But, um, you know, I think that's important that they're changing the labeling because it was very, um, you know, derogatory and negative. But again, it, those type of changes that the government does in a top-down fashion. You know, that's great, and it's going to trickle down and have influence at academic centers and stuff, but it's going to take quite a while before the average person changes. And again, people that are um, primary care physicians that are out there in rural areas, uh, they're still going to call people chiho, and it's going to take a long time for that to change. But at least the government's making a formal statement that they don't want the pejorative terms used anymore, but, you know, it, it does. it's going to take a long time to change. Um. I want to get back to pick up on Ralph's uh, comment from Robert, if I may. Uh, not even to get in. I'm not sure who's is doing that, but anyway, uh, not not to even get into the, the possible possibility of romanticizing or doing something like that. 
I'm curious about the whole idea that a circumlocution is a pathology, that is, as opposed to a way of communicating. That is, you know, I've had people say to me, well, I went to see the person who takes care of me when I'm not well physically. And I would say, well, you mean the dentist? And she said, well, it could be, but not in this case. I said, do you mean the mailman? And she said, no, this is a female person. And I said, do you mean a physician? She said, yes. Now, I did that just for the sake of the record, to say, well, this person knew the word she wanted and would recognize it when she heard it but couldn't recall it. But she was still communicating successfully. And so I wonder if there's any movement among linguists to redefine a circumlocution as a positive way of communicating an idea without using the exact word itself. So the answer depends on the linguist, I suppose. But, I mean, it depends on the linguistic specialty. So if you're talking about it to a clinical physiologist who's interested in patterns of language loss, et cetera, then that person might look at the word circumlocution as might pathologize that word. But if you're talking to a discourse analyst, suddenly circumlocution becomes a really rather rich source of evidence about this person's ability and language and et cetera. So, I mean, yeah, so it's discipline specific. Hi. I'm still here. And I have a question, and I think it's for Ralph. You know, I've just – I'm sorry, Robert. But I have a lot of questions for you, Ralph. Anyway, there's a really interesting paper by Nancy Twana called Epistemologies of Ignorance. And I was quite struck by your talking about controlled processing as being lost in Alzheimer's disease, and that included word finding. But as you described it, controlled processing also includes turn taking, which is not lost. So I'm wondering what that makes you think. Right. So I think probably to be accurate, I wouldn't want to say that controlled processing is lost in Alzheimer's disease. I would say that cognitive tasks that require controlled processing are more affected by the disease. And so, I mean, just to be somewhat more careful about that. And, yes, it is rather curious that this turn taking ability, which seems to be something that would require a good deal of attention, is not a sort of preformed chunk of cognitive activity, that that doesn't seem to be as affected by Alzheimer's disease as, say, for instance, topic maintenance, for instance. I don't know. I really don't know why that would be, except to say that the notion of controlled and automatic processing is relative to every task, and tasks are relative to one another. So I'm not sure. Do you have a thought about what that might be? I mean, turn taking obviously is a different sort of linguistic component, for instance, than syntactic complexity. Those are two different ones, I think. But let me say this. I mean, I think one of the problems, of course, in particular the psychology of psycholinguistics, is our tendency to treat language as a property, an instrumental property of an individual, and not to treat it as a social phenomenon. It's a conversation. Okay. We have time for just one more question. Right here. Is this working? I just wanted to make one or two comments. Andrea, the first comment I would like to make is about the statement that you made that developing countries don't have this problem of Alzheimer's. In fact, because of the absolute numbers of people living in developing countries. It's just a question of proportion. It isn't a question of proportion. The absolute numbers in other countries. I have to disagree. I don't think that in Afghanistan there's a large percentage of people over 85 years old. Okay. Secondly, I also have had experience living in Japan for eight years of my life. I've done plenty of research in anthropology there and in related disciplines. And I think that the fact that there are so many people living in developing countries is a very important factor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
disciplines, uh, a lot of it to do with aging. Um, the last uh, major study I did in connection with aging was about uh, 25 years ago. And um, I, while I agree with you entirely that certainly at that time I found endless number of women trapped in their homes as daughters-in-law caring for their mothers-in-law and the relationship was often very bad but the relationship in many other cases was extraordinarily good and loving and warm um, but there have been massive changes in the last 30 years 25 30 years they were beginning to take place while I was there and um, it seems to me that uh, I, I, I was actually stunned at the way you rendered all the Japanese in your presentation as rather helpless one way and another, including the professionals. Well, um, I'm sorry the geriatric that came society, that way. the, 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 the Dr. Maeda in Japan and the Center for Aging have done incredible things in the past 30 years. Well, I taught in a university done. for 12 years in a department that looked at gerontology, and right. I have to say, you know, it's. A, 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 I, I just. I just would, I, I'm just... No, but I, I want to emphasize that um, I... I uh, okay. well, I'm not sure, Arthur, that I actually have a question. I just, I just am absolutely bowled over. I haven't heard this kind of presentation well, about I hope I emphasize in years that and years and years. Well, it and hasn't changed it's, in a lot it, of ways. It is, I, 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 the statement I want to make is that I have absolutely no doubt that this is somewhat lopsided and top heavy and my experience in Japan is that there is plenty going on and if one reads the media and looks at the impact of information technology just for one example in that country one finds that changes take place in the most remote rural areas incredibly quickly it's one of the most highly information advanced countries in the world and they use that very, very adeptly. Okay. So I think there's a lot of very positive stuff yeah, going I, I'm on. Not I realize that nursing homes and saying. so on present problems. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not going to disagree with anything you said, but I do want to emphasize that um, I did, you know, there's a huge variability in terms of rural, urban, and in terms of socioeconomic status, and there's still a very strong role for daughter-in-laws that has a very strong set of expectations, and I know that from the work we did in nursing homes where we had family caregiver support groups. And so there's a large group of population in rural areas that have to deal with not being diagnosed and being essentially blamed. And it is a large group. And now if you're in Tokyo and in academic centers, you're going to have a different experience. But there is a, that does exist as a reality there. So, although I'm not disagreeing. Okay.